Good morning, everyone. It's 7 a.m. It's time to start our virtual breakfast. Today, we're going to have Dr. Isan Gane, and he's going to talk about drainage systems. So if you have questions during his presentation, make sure to use the chat box, and you're going to be answered those questions after his talk. After that, we're still going to be on for those that had questions that were not answered, or maybe also if you have other questions not related to drainage systems or weather, we're going to have a bunch of specialists on here today. So it's your chance to ask those questions. And we might even have some of them giving us some updates. With that, are you ready, my friend? I'm ready as it could get. All right, so the floor is yours. And thank you all so much. Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to the virtual breakfast uh, this Thursday. So my topic of discussion and talk is going to be about drainage design. And it's going to be related to water quality, crop protection, environmental protection. And as Ricardo mentioned, if you have questions, put, please put it in the chat. I'll be happy to answer the questions after the presentation. And so my name is, again, um, Hassan Ghane. I'm an assistant professor and extension specialist with Michigan State. We know that agricultural drainage is vital for crop production because it helps remove excess water from the farm and we really can't do without agricultural drainage. We can't have a crop production, the extent of crop production that we have uh, without agricultural drainage. But there is an unintended consequence with drainage and that's removal and uh, transport of nutrients to downstream water bodies. This is a photo I took my, uh, during my last trip to Lake Erie. You can see um, the cup, uh, this plastic cup that I got, and I dumped some of the water into the cup, took a photo, and you can see the algae floating in the water. It's very interesting. But the main point here is that there's problems with water quality related to subsurface drainage, tile drainage, and we need to take some actions with that. And I'll show you what uh, some of the things are. Historically, from ancient farmers, drainage was known to remove water and help with crop production. So crop production aspect of drainage is, has been the primary goal uh, historically, and it's still the goal these days. But we really need to have environmental objectives and goals come in too these days because of the water quality issues that we're having in our water bodies. So the target is to uh, um, look at both of these together when we design our drainage system. So there's nutrient reduction strategies that can help um, reduce nutrients in subsurface drainage. The main one I'm going to be talking about is drainage design. That's the topic of the day, which is going to be related to drain depth and also drain spacing. There's topics about uh, conservation drainage, that I'm not going to be talking about. It's going to be related to control drainage, such as buffer, and other conservation drainage practices. So the one on the left, drainage design, typically doesn't get really talked about. The one on the right, conservation drainage practices, that gets talked about a lot. So I'm going to focus on the one on the left, drainage design. So the first one under the drainage design strategy is drain depth. So drain depth, typically, it depends on the soil, crop, and plow capability. And in Michigan, drain depth is typically between ranges between 28 to 36 inches. But research shows that shallow drains are better for environmental protection. That's very important. So if you have about 30 inches, you are going to be in that shallow drain depth um, area. So research shows that if you do if you have those shallow drains, you're going to reduce nitrogen and phosphorus loss, and that's very important for environmental protection. And also research has shown that, so far research has shown that, there is no yield loss. So if you put your drains shallower, you're not going to get hit, you're not going to lose yield. Second point, third point is also about uh, when you have shallow drains, you're going to have less water drain over a shorter period of time, as opposed to more water being drained with the deeper drains over a longer period of time. So imagine you're during the growing season and it doesn't rain much like this, this season, and you need that water for the crop. So if you have your shallow drains, it's going to be better. It's going to reduce some of that risk for droughts uh, because it's going to 
drain less water. It's going to leave more water in that soil profile. It has its benefits to have shallow drains. The, the point here is that when you have those shallow drains, you're going to have to narrow down your spacings so you can have the same drainage performance as you would if you had the deeper. So shallow drains come with narrower spacings, and that brings a little bit extra cost to the system. So uh, what's important here is that th this would be a good, uh, good strategy for agencies to adopt and also provide some financial incentive, in my opinion, for doing shallow drains. The water quality of this practice has been shown and it has its benefits. So this is something, uh, a message that I have for agencies that this would be hopefully looked at in the future to provide some financial incentives for this. Just like there's financial in incentives for controlled drainage, for example, the conservation drainage, this is also something that can help protect water quality. So that's the, that was the drain, space, drain depth topic. So the, let's talk about a little bit about the drain spacing. So um, to start the topic, um, the question is, I wanna ask the question, how do we get the drain spacing? So how does it typically work here in Michigan and the Midwest? So it works in a way that the drainage contractor or the farmer, they choose based on judgment and experience, or they refer to tables from local drainage guides. And local drainage guides provide a range of spacing, for example, 20 to 40 feet based on this soil series, for example. And also finally, the farmer has the final say because they're going to be paying for it. So they may just decide that they want a certain spacing uh, because of the cost or because you know, neighbors in the vicinity, they had that kind of spacing. So there are different factors playing. So it's basically uh, chosen. Uh, there is no engineering calculation behind that typically. So why is that drain spacing important? So if we choose a drain spacing based on um, based on the choice and based on the ranges in those uh, drainage guides, and that turns out to be too wide for that specific location, that's gonna have water removal that's gonna be too slow. So a drain spacing that's too wide, it's gonna result in the water removal that's too slow. And that means that there's gonna be less total water drain, and we do not want that. Why? because it's gonna be, it's gonna result in yield loss due to wet stress. That's the whole purpose of drainage. We wanna remove excess water and you don't wanna be too wide. On the other hand, if you have a drain spacing that's too, too narrow, that's gonna remove water too quickly than necessary. And that means that there's gonna be more water drained. And, and also you don't want that either because when you have too much water drained, then the problem is that you're gonna get problems with drought stress. You are just draining that soil too fast, too quickly. You're not gonna leave much water for that crop. So that's the crop yield is gonna get hit. It's gonna increase capital cost, increase the cost of the drainage system. It's gonna increase nutrient loss. You don't want that either. That's the problem. That's gonna um, hurt water quality. And also it's gonna increase peak flow. But if you have something in between, that's actually something that's based on the local soil and weather conditions of that location, of that field, you're going to have the optimum drain spacing, and that's going, to re that's going to result in the necessary water removal. And that's what you really want. You want to be in between. You don't want to be too narrow. You don't want to be too wide. You want to be at the optimum drain spacing. And that's going to result in maximum annual return on investment and also it's going to help protect water quality it protects water quality by avoiding those two narrow ones that are based on and a guess so that's why drain spacing is important so to help with that drain spacing uh, we developed a tool this is the link on the web page so if you go to this link you go to my website this is, this is my drainage website. You hover over drainage tools, you go over drainage design tools, you click on drain spacing tool, then you're taken to another page. From this page, you click on the link to go to the tool, then the tool opens up. Click OK for the message, then zoom in to your 
location that you're interested in getting some optimum gene spacing estimate. So then as you zoom in, then you draw a shape around your area of interest. And here I want to change the planting it to 5th of May. And I'm going to leave my design drain depth to two and a half feet because I want to be within that shallow drain depth. And then I'm going to hit calculate. And then at the bottom, I'm showing here is that there's another layer that you can, if you check that box, you say soil layer, you can see the soil map on this, which is pretty cool. Uh, so then I got here for this estimate, I got 40 feet drain spacing for this location. That's going to, uh, that's, that's an estimate that's going to result in a maximum. Um, annual return on investment. So that's that's key. That's very important. You want to be close to that, close to this, because this is an estimate, of course. So just to quickly give you uh, what what goes on in the background. This is drain spacing versus relative yield, and then there's annual return on investment on the right axis. This is going to be the crop yield, how it varies over time, and this is going to be the profits. So the tool, the concept behind the tool is that it's going to go into the maximum of that profit because it wants to give you maximum profit. That's key. And in this case, the 44 feet is the maximum profit, and that's going to be the optimum drain spacing. So if you want to learn um, more about the tool, the tool I just showed you is just the basics of the tool, the basic version. There is an advanced more version to get a better estimate. We teach that during our drainage workshop. We have a tentative date March 9th to 11th, 2021. And this year uh, we, we have new section. We're going to actually also have drainage design software taught too. So that's a new feature of our drainage workshop. This information will be on my website as well. Something that I hear um, a lot these days about ponding on the surface, um, if you have those extended periods of time that there's water sitting on the surface, let's say for the week, more than three or four days, that's the problem. And that would be because of the soil compaction that restricts infiltration, that's very common. I, I hear that a lot these days and field operation under wet conditions can pack that soil and so water doesn't infiltrate. With that, um, conclusion was that shallow drains are better for the environment, provide some financial incentive for this uh, shallow drains, and also optimal drain spacing was developed based on the tool. With that, I, I am done. Thank you for your attention. Isan, uh, thank you very much for the presentation. I appreciate that. Are you ready for your question? Yes. All right. Okay. So Lisa, she asked the question, if you have deeper, wider tile drainage and you want to go to 30 inches and less wide, how do you deal with the old tile? Can you leave it? How will it affect the new system? That's an excellent question. So the question is, if you have the, if you have the deeper, wider drains that you installed, um, a while ago, that's the traditional uh, way. And now you want to go with the shallower drains, but the shallower drains require a little bit narrower spacings. What do you do? Well, uh, because like I said, like I said, one is shallower, one is deeper. So they're not at the same height so that they won't intersect. The drains will not intersect. So you, what you can do, there's different, different options. I suggest you consult your drainage contractor in your area as well. So you could basically, you can shut off the old system. You can cut off those pipes at the beginning, at, at the end. Uh, that's one way. And then install the shallow because the shallow is at the closer, uh, uh, closer to the ground service is not going to be uh, cutting through the old one. Um, another way, uh, this is the typical way that I would think would be useful. Another way you could leave the old one. Um, so you have the old one, then you have your shallow one, and you will have the water going to the same collector main system. And you then you will actually have a control structure to manage that water. That would be that would be very useful. The reason I'm saying that is that the second option is that in Australia they did the same thing. In Australia they had 
uh, research was done on the same idea where they had these uh, older, traditional, deeper, wider, and then they came in on the shallower depth. They installed those narrower, shallower drains, and they managed the system with the same outlet, and they found better water quality, and it was, it was a very successful strategy. It's very uncommon. I've never heard of anybody doing it here in, in North America, but they've, they've done it in Australia for different applications, of course. They had, you know, they irrigate, they remove that water for salinity, but the concept is the same, that you can actually work with both of them. This is something that I suggest you consult with your drainage contractor, but that shallow drain does, I want to emphasize that it's, it's important. Uh, it helps with water quality. But excellent question. So two options for that, thank you. The second question is, I have it written down. So the question is, can improving soil conditions, for example, improving soil conditions would be, um, you have reduced tillage and you improve infiltration and movement of water. That's, that's what it means, improving soil conditions. So can improving soil conditions negate the need for that costly shallow drain? So it, that's an excellent question again. Thank you for asking that. So the, the water quality aspect of this is related to hydrology, water. Water is the dominant force moving nutrients. If you slow down water, you can slow down some of the nutrients. So that's key. That's a fact. So um, if you improve soil conditions and then you have, say, deep drains, you are gonna still move a lot more water and a lot more nutrients to the ditch and Lake Erie and other uh, water bodies than your shallow drain. So the answer is, it depends. In this example that I gave you, it's not gonna improve, it's not gonna negate, it's not gonna be a replacement for that shallow drain. Because if you improve soil quality and you have deep drains, that's still gonna remove lots of nutrients out. The key is to remove less water. And not, when I say less water, I don't mean to hurt the crop. Less water by, while maintaining the performance of the drainage system. So your crop is gonna do well, as good, but just less nutrient leaving. That's, that's very important and it's not been emphasized um, these days. So I'd like to really emphasize that shallow drain. So that's an excellent question again, thank you. There's another question from Mark. Do you see control structures as being as useful as the shallow drains that you discussed for water quality? So the question is basically how comparing the, the value, comparing the water quality benefits of having a control drainage with a control structure versus the shallow drains. This is the question. Um, it's a difficult question. Um, so it, it really depends on very different soils, the weather. I uh, really can't compare those, but we can say that both of them have water quality benefits. And what it, if, you can, if you combine those, it's going to be even better because shallow drains are good to some extent. Yes, they remove enough water for your crops to be healthy, and it's going to be less than the deeper drains. But if you, have, if you manage that water as well as you know, its own benefits, then you're gonna get even better um, water quality benefit. And also with, the, with that control structure that you mentioned, Mark, there's also potential water quality benefits in drier years. So the key point that we found with this control drainage and control structures is that you get a wet year and it just rains and rains. I mean, uh, control drainage is not gonna do you good for, for crop yield. But if you are in a drier year, a year like this year up to now, I mean, it doesn't rain much. So if you have that soil profile with a higher moisture, it's gonna be better than the soil profile that is just moving all of that water out really quickly. Again, that was a very good question. So the, another question from Phil, uh, with a more shallow, with a shallower drain system, will there be more challenges with root zones in tilings? That's an excellent question. So that, Again, depends on what's on that surface, what crop is on that surface. So generally, you know, generally speaking, um, annual crops, uh, they have less risk than perennials. Like if you have a tree on the side of your farm and then you don't want to go with a perforated pipe there, you want to have a solid pipe both in that area or shrubs, it really depends on that situation. 
So if you have those shallow drains and the, those roots actually are water thirsty and go down, then yes, that would be a problem. You have to manage that. You have to know what crop is on the surface. And also another way um, to reduce the risk of the roots going in, clogging those pipes is to have control drainage. If you have control drainage, you are gonna be holding some of that water in those pipes. And when the pipe has water, the surrounding soil is gonna be saturated for some time. Roots don't like extended water, saturated water, right? They don't like that. So that can help. If things go dry, roots are gonna come go down and find that water. So control drain is one of those strategies that you can help, even if you have that shallow drain, you can uh, help reduce that risk. And also it depends on the crop on the surface too. That's a, that's a new topic, that root clogging. So a lot of drainage specialists like me, they're looking at this topic, see you know, what is going on, what kind of crop is on that surface that is causing this, that we really didn't, you know, it wasn't so prevalent like now. So we're looking at that very closely. We'll have um, findings hopefully in the next year. Would you recommend shallow drains? No, for perennial crops, um, that's, a, that's a good question. So would I recommend you have shallow drains if you have perennial crops? Well, perennial crops probably, I would say um, no, because those roots are perennials, right? They're gonna go a little deeper. So I would not recommend that. Mike says, uh, what is the magnesium level that will reduce infiltration rate? So this is the question regarding uh, that last slide, it was kind of an off topic, not related to the shallow drains, just a um, topic about if you have, if that surface has lots of sodium and also ha has lots of magnesium, what I mentioned was the magnesium, then that structure is not very good, it breaks down. So adding calcium improves that soil structure, aggregates, makes these aggregates. So it says, what is that level of parts per million concentration that will actually do that. That's something that um, any of the soil scientists are on the call, they will jump in to answer that, that, uh, that question. So Isan, um, go, uh, going back to that question from asking about if improving soil conditions can negate the need for costly drain systems. Just, so just to make that sure, so let's say I don't have the money right now to make the investment but I wanted to try to minimize my, like, like to, uh, to actually increase my water infiltration. So I don't have the option to spend the money. So like, for example, cover crops. So, I mean, I think what we are asking here, what can I do when I don't have the money, but I still can work to try to minimize the chance for that over water uh, in my field, if that makes sense. Is there any low cost thing for low budget? So that I think that's what we are asking here. Well, that, yes, yeah, so the, like you just finished, low budget, low cost, that, the, the, the least cost would be a control structure. Because if you want to design a whole field with the shallow drains, that's going to cost, a, I mean, tremendously a lot more than having a structure at the edge of the field to manage that water. And when you manage that water with control structure, you're having less water leave. So it's kind of, the, the concept is the same as shallow drains. The concept is the same because shallow drains also reduce drainage discharge, just like a control structure will reduce drainage discharge. Concept is the same and it's a lot cheaper um, with that uh, control structure. And do you think maybe like, a, a like investing like in crop rotation, cover crop, that, that can have any, uh, like can affect that a little bit as well, or you don't think that is as important so that actually have a drainage system? So that's a good question. All, so let me ask that question in a little bit different way. Some people say, um, they'll ask me, if we have reduced tillage, no-till, and rotation crops um, vary that crop to improve that soil structure, that's going to improve water movement in that soil. And then they'll ask me, okay, do, are we, if we just keep doing this in 5, 10 years or 20 years, are we going to need drainage? Am I going to be out of a job? So, you know, <laughs> No, <laughs> I'm gonna. Hopefully, I'll keep my job. 
so <laughs> we are going to need drainage. It's drainage is not going to go away. It's not that if we have lots of lots of good quality soil, drainage is going to go away because that water, if you, even if you have water go down quicker, then at the lower profiles, that water still has, has to go somewhere because if it doesn't go anywhere, there's an impermeable layer, that water is just going to start to build up. So drainage is not going to go away, the drainage is going to remain. So improving the soil, soil, of course, is going to help infiltration. It's going to reduce, key is it's going to reduce surface funding because that no-till and those other reduced tillage practices and cover crops, they're going to help that and the water help the soil structure improve and then the sky water is going to infiltrate. So it's going to reduce water funding, surface funding, and reduce surface runoff, which is really important as well. So that's a very good question. Reducing surface runoff is very important because particulate phosphorus moves with that surface runoff. We want to reduce that, uh, but, uh, but on the, at the same time, then that water management is going to be a key concept we're going to have to have to reduce some of that water because water, our hydrology of water, is the dominant force moving nutrients. But excellent questions. Thank you. Isan, Isan, and just like maybe to finish, like, uh, so the take home message after this presentation is we need to pay more attention to shallow drainage, right? I mean, we haven't talked as much about it. So I think the take home, the take -home message is let's talk more about that. Because it, in, in the end, if you're doing uh, annual crops, it's cheaper and it's easier and can get you better results. Am I correct? So did I take your message? So, Correct. Yes, so the, me the message is that shallow drains, um, we need to consider that more. Of course, it's going to depend on the, the farm, what's going to be cropped on that farm, the, you know, the specific site, specific conditions. But we have to consider that. We have to recognize that shallow drains are going to be better for environment than deeper drains because they're going to be removing less water. And also um, for, you know, the crop. If it's, if it's so dry, that deeper drain is gonna remove a lot more water. And on average, actually, this is important too, I didn't mention that. On average, the deeper drains are gonna have a, a deeper water table on average over the course of the whole year. So the shallow drain is gonna have a higher one, not that too much to hurt the crop. So if you, if you have a water table, you're gonna have capillarized waters, water um, going up, that's gonna provide the water for the crop a little bit better on average than the deeper one. So yes, the key message is shallow drains. We need to recognize it's gonna have um, water quality benefits and it's gonna be site specific, of course, but we need to recognize that that's gonna be um, the case and we need to consider that shallow drains and also the water management part of it too. Isan, my friend, thank you very much. I, um, actually, I do have one question. Can you see that from Phil? Yes, it says, uh, please provide re research that addresses the magnesium addition to the soil for infiltration. Um, the, I, I will um, investigate that. That would be very helpful if our soil scientists um, would help with that, find some references for that. The, so that part come, actually, yes, I can help you with that. I, I just remembered that there's a good publication. Isan, thank you very much, sir. Really appreciate it. Um, and now, I want to see if we have anyone that want to step up, one of the specialists, maybe want to step up and give us some updates. I know that I see a few on, or maybe some other of uh, extension educators want to give a quick update about what's going on in the state. We Do need we rain. <laughs> Thank you, Paul. <laughs> Apparently, you have um, to go to Jeff's house to get the rain, so. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> the tiny cloud that was over Jeff yesterday. All right, so... On Tuesday, we had a nice shower south of Mount Pleasant, between Mount Pleasant and Alma. There's people got as much as two inches of rain. In how many hours, Paul? I mean, how long that took to get those two inches? Oh, it was, it was a pretty short period of time. I think it was similar to Jeff's. I think it rained for an hour, 50 minutes to an hour. Kind of set right over top. Two miles away, they didn't get anything. You need to spread it around. That's, that's the goal here over the next 24 hours. So, Jeff, do you think that there's a high likelihood that two-thirds of the state will see rain and one-third will not? I, I, think, I think it'll be higher than that. Um, the, 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 the have-nots will probably be uh, hopefully a fairly small number. That's, that's, it's looking better with time. 
Uh, so I'm somebody uh, as always somebody gets missed, but hopefully it'll be very uh, very small area. I'd like to ask Mike a question about soybeans. Uh, you know, we always think soybeans are made in August, but you know, at what point in time on some of our lighter soils do we get significant tissue damage that that they can't recover? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, I think typically at the stage they're in right now, we're pretty we're pretty good. Um, one of the clear cut signs is if you're starting to see leaf loss. If you're starting to see leaves dropping off, those lower leaves dropping off because of excessive temperatures and, and moisture stress, you've hurt the plants. The plants are hurt. I'm not saying they won't come back with the rains in August, but even with the rains in August, they, they have been hurt. So if you're not losing leaves, I, I think there's reason for optimism. That, that's my perspective at this time. Thanks, Mike. Has anyone yeah. seen a spider mite after the article that I sent out earlier? I'm just wondering if anybody's seen any strip spider mites sucking things. I haven't seen spider mites, Chris, but are you seeing or hearing a lot of uh, leaf hopper, alfalfa? I see them in dry beans. Leaf hoppers came in uh, heavy early on, that, that early uh, move. And I'll blame Jeff for that because they were moving on weather fronts. And so when, when you get more in, of course, they start at a higher level. And I know Phil and a few other people have, uh, have asked about thresholds and things like, like that. And potato leaf hopper feeding is bad enough, but it kind of interacts with drought, drought stress to make things a little bit worse. So, um, you know, that's just something to watch for, mostly in forage crops and then dry, dry, dry beans as well. And then anybody out there who are doing some of the commercial vegetable crops, they also can, can get hit with potato leaf hopper, like potato and things like that. Chris, I have had reports of leaf hoppers, especially in the, the lower part of the state, right along the border. Uh, some of the producers along the state line there have been hammered with leaf hoppers and so they've been spraying uh, to the high thresholds. Good. A lot, when, when you see that, that hopper burn symptom, that damage has been happening already. So that's something it's kind of hard to, to deal with. Maybe next week I can focus on some of those things, maybe show, show some pictures because I'm up for next week and then give some of the thresholds. So um, it'll be another week. We'll see what happens with the, with the rains. But if we're not getting any significant moisture and it remains warm and hot, then we're going to continue to have these kind of problems. Thank you, Chris. Jeff, uh, did you see the question from Dan uh, on the chat box? Oh, no, I, I did not. I'm sorry. So he's asking for how much moisture you're going to see in, our, in, our, in, in Northeast Michigan. Northeast, um, I'm going to say quarter to, to three quarters here. Uh, between now and, and, and Saturday. That would be, that, I think, a fairly good guess. Maybe, and there will be some areas that get more than that, some areas that less, but a half to three quarters would probably be a pretty good general estimate. Awesome. Yeah, this so is one last I, thing. I, I, Jeff, yeah. you talked about uh, troughs last, last week, and I was watching the Weather Channel, which just seemed like my favorite, and they were also talking about troughs, and I understood what they were talking about. It, had to, it also had to do with the movement of hurricanes. Uh, going up the coast or coming across, so and yep. delivering a lot of moisture, and, and it was that that was sort of an interesting thing because you had just told us about troughs. So that's good. Well, hopefully we won't have to deal with <laughs> cyclones anytime soon again. But we we have already this this year, so it's it's not as if it's unheard of here. But and they do. Yeah, they, it's where the uh, tropics meet the extra tropics, sort of that that situation. Chris, uh, just one comment from Aisha. She said she has been seeing some cicadas in. In hair crop. I did hear cicadas out. Now I didn't I didn't know that they were getting into crops. I mean you kind of hear them. They mostly feed on trees. I don't know if it, if there is a hatch this year of a particular brood of the multi-year cicada. I don't I can't recall but we always get the annual cicadas that come out every year and uh, like last week I heard my first one. So they'll be up in the tree doing their little singing thing and that tells you it's hot because you hear them out there. So could Marty right. give maybe an update on uh, tar spot? I understand I saw a map this morning that we have uh, some issues. Or not issues yet, but it's been identified. Yeah, good morning. Um, so yeah, just some tar spot found in uh, Gratiot County. Very low incidence and severity at this point in time. Um, I wouldn't get, 
I, I'd certainly scout for it. And it sounds like there's more being found in Indiana at the moment. There's a couple of counties up in uh, northwest Indiana. Um, so I wouldn't get too excited about it, but I'd definitely be scouting for it. Um, this might be one of those instances where like a VTR1 timing might be too early uh, for task spot management. So that's why we might be better to wait if we were, uh, if we were planning on a fungicide application, wait until you know, um, disease starts to pick up and weather is more favorable for that. Thank you. All right, um, Martin, thank you very much for the update. Appreciate that. Phil, it's 8 a.m. and I think those people, they wanna go do their stuff. So thank you guys so much for joining us today. I had a lot of fun and stay tuned. We're gonna have Chris DeFonso coming up next week. So gonna be a lot of fun as well. With that, thank you all and enjoy your day.